My name is Christina Kwok. I am a fellow at the Center for Universal Education here at Brookings Institution. And I would like to introduce our lovely panelists here today. Um, to my immediate left, who I think many of you have seen this morning, is Jin Chu. She is a 2018 Echidna Global Scholar, also Program Specialist at UNESCO's in RULED, um, and an Associate Professor at Beijing Normal University. Then to her left is Kristen Schutz, um, who is Associate Professor of Psychology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Then Anna Muru, who is Partnership Manager at VVOB Education for Development. And then Christia Spears-Brown, Director of the Center for Equality and Social Justice, as well as Professor of Developmental Psychology at the University of Kentucky. So we have a very um, academic and practice-based uh, panel here today. And I wanted to get us started just kind of contextualizing this particular panel. As a community focused on girls' education, um, we have, especially in the last 10 to 15 years, really focused on the adolescent girls' education. And we know that at adolescence, um, girls' worlds around girls' worlds around the world shrinks incredibly as their male peers' worlds begin to expand. And we have seldom taken the time to really think about the girl child under the age of 10 and especially under the age of 5, um, primarily because of the great tremendous progress we've made on getting girls into primary school. And so Jin's presentation this morning has really helped the, our girls' education community fill in some of that gap in the conversation, um, and particularly in the context of China, too. Um, so I'm really eager to hear from all of you how you all have gotten to this work, um, and especially on why focusing on gender is particularly important. So maybe we'll start um, with Christia, if you would like to get us going and tell us a little bit about kind of why gender is so important in the early childhood years. Um, so I think that's uh, two questions embedded within one, right? So one is why is gender so important? And then the second part is why in early childhood so important? And so one thing that we know to answer the early childhood part first is that we know that kids' experiences in early childhood are really critical. Um, so for one, because the opportunities that they're given shape their actual neural development. So whenever kids or when any of us have a thought, one neuron connects to another neuron, which connects to another, which leads to structural changes in the brain. And the more that those are used, the stronger that they become and the more competent that we become at those tasks. We can do them quicker and better. We also know that early childhood is a really critical point in neural development. By the time kids get to be age nine, they start to lose 20 billion synapses a day if they're not being used. So the experiences kids are getting pre-age nine are going to lead to structural changes that they carry the rest of their lives. So if they're not given opportunities early on, it's much harder to get those skills later in life. So then you add the level of gender, and what we see is that gender then restricts a lot of the opportunities that kids are getting, given in that early ages. And even in cultural contexts in which there's a lot of gender um, equality, we still see that teachers and parents are giving kids different opportunities and experiences um, at those ages, so five, six, and seven. And so that's going to lead to long-term changes. We also know that gender is really important to kids at three, four, five, six, and seven. Gender is one of the most important characteristics that kids think about with themselves. It's a thing that they think about when they look at other people. And so because gender is so salient, kids are really attentive to the ways in which gender are important in their lives. So if they notice boys and girls being treated differently or men and women being treated differently, they are hyper vigilant on those differences because it's an important part of how they're defining themselves. And so they, they're almost their own worst enemy when it comes to really self-selecting information that's gender stereotypical. We know that their gender stereotypes are really strong and peaking at four, five, and six years old. Um, and so, again, you put that on top of the lifelong impact that having a really singular focus on what's appropriate for your gender, you get really gender differentiated trajectories in place really early on. And so if you just focus on adolescence, it's really kind of the end of the trajectory, especially for interested in girls in education. Um, it's really the end of the trajectory. I think all of these things cascade. And so you really have to look at the beginning of the trajectory because you know the changes that they're 
that they're, or the choices that they're making early, so when girls are five and six, they're choosing one particular thing they might be interested in, and they're getting experience and skills in that, then that leads to another experience, which leads to skills in that, and that by the time they've taken those different trajectories, it's really hard to reverse that by the time they're 14, 15, 16 years old, because they've already built a decade worth of experiences um, that are gender differentiated because of their own interests and the interests that are really given to them by the adults in their lives. Thank you, Chrystia. Anna, what about you? Yes. Uh, well, VDOV works with uh, teacher education um, and uh, also with, um, you know, uh, leadership, educational leadership. And um, we all know that teachers are such an important part of a child's life. And so they are the ones who, together with the, uh, the leaders in the school, that are able to provide the opportunity for all children to learn and thrive um, in the school environment. So for us, uh, working with equity, working with uh, gender is, is a natural uh, thing because we know that a good teacher and a teacher who is gender aware and who is aware of you know, their influence and what their stereotypes bring to the classroom is able to provide a good opportunity for learning for, uh, for all children. So uh, as, we, as we have been uh, you know, working with early childhood education, which is still quite new for many countries in, uh, in Africa especially, we have noted that uh, teachers bring to the classroom all their luggage of you know, stereotypes or their beliefs, and uh, these are then transmitted in the classroom uh, in the way they select the materials, in the way they organize, uh, you know, their lesson plans, how they organize play, how they organize the groups, you know, what kind of uh, attention they give to the children, the kind of language that they use towards children, which is either empowering or disempowering. So children, as, as she has said, and as uh, Jin has said this, this uh, earlier this morning, are very prone to, 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 to these things, and they, they are basically accumulating all this knowledge. And uh, so it's very important that the teacher is aware of what damage they can do to the children uh, from an early age and the importance of how they address children, how they, they give them the confidence that they can thrive and that they can have the opportunities that, uh, that they deserve. So it's, it's, a, it's a big discussion and it's something that we're trying to, uh, to bring to teachers but also to, to school leaders about you know, how, how can they ensure that all children are given the same opportunity and how can they be more mindful about you know, how they speak and uh, you know the things that they portray, and what kind of role modeling can they uh, also give to the children uh, in the classroom, uh, but also in the way they, they teach uh, as well. So it's the whole discourse about you know pedagogy, but also about uh, empowering uh, children through uh, the language, the interaction, through interactions between teachers themselves as well, through in the school environment. What kind of things can be done to ensure that children, all children, regardless of their gender, regardless of their social economic backgrounds, are given given the space and the opportunity to actually, uh, you know, live the classroom to the fullest rather than be limited by, you know, the, their own beliefs and how, and how they behave. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Thank you, Anna. Kristen, what about you? How have you come to this work um, and research? Yeah, I started, so I'm a developmental psychologist and I have a lab and in that lab we're interested in um, how children begin to understand their social world, what features they use to choose social partners for themselves, how do they decide who to trust, how they decide how to think about people. And I was just struck in study after study, kind of building on what both of you are saying, as to how much of a role gender plays in guiding children's um, consideration of other people and themselves. So I came to study gender because that is what came out of the data as such a primary um, thing that very young children were thinking about. And then that's led to further questions, which I think will come up later about, um, I started thinking about, okay, why do children make such a big deal of gender? Where do they get this message? Um, if it is from their culture that it is so important, it is so important to think of themselves and other people in those terms. And that's really been a motivator of some of my um, more current research, just a drive to understand and how is it that children come to think that gender is so important early in life and what role might adults in society be playing in guiding that way of thinking about the world? Jin, how did, um, in your work in China, how did you come to see gender stereotypes and gender and early childhood play out later in life? Like what, what brought you to see gender as being something that was so important for China to look at now? Um, 
Because my my work originally is in early childhood, um, but I spent around seven years uh, leading project in girls' education, women leadership. Um, I often think uh, for for six years, I often think it is important to catch up at early childhood, because when we review the projects um, with the development leaders in China, I have worked with them and to review the. Sustainable, impactful projects in China, and they all tend to agree. Uh, gender stereotype is very hard to tackle, and and if some development projects have make great impact in the local context, they has to deal with the gender stereotypes, and then how to deal with that? It can be very hard, and then I found that um, why not we. We have、um, leave a gap at the early childhood level, and also when I look at、um, the developmental issues from the economic perspective, and I found that both area just、uh, need to combine and just the right things to do. Such a right thing because、um, mo- mostly for the country,、um, girls' education is the best inv- investment for a country can make, and especially for the div-、uh, disadvantaged children, if if in with limited budget and and invest in the, in this group of children,、um, the great. The great returns can get.、Um, why not?、Um, there is a kind of gap.、Um, I have the opportunity to to work with the、uh, grassroots level. I also have experience to work with the teachers in the classroom, in kindergartens, in primary schools. I, I also train teachers because I found I found、uh, those organizations.、Um, they all tend to agree、um, that is an important issue. So when I look at the、uh, international agenda, it is important. Look at from economic perspective, it is important. And also research found in psychology and anthropology, neuroscience education also found is important.、Um, in the classroom, teacher or grade is important, but at the policy level and practices, is is the gap. So that why I bring this issue、uh, and to to explore this pathway.、Mm-hmm. So let's talk a little bit about like about development, child development.、Um, Kristen, you mentioned that you work in a lab、um, studying children's social behaviors and how children understand social hierarchies,、um, categories. The first question I would pose to you, and then I would love for all the panelists to, to respond to this too, is why is gender the significant category? Versus all the other categories, Christia,、yeah, we were talking earlier about a, a study、uh, that really pointed to how. You know, it wasn't really the cultural pieces, but gender the gender differences just blew everything out of the water, right? So maybe Kristen, if you want to start first and tell us, you know, how are children developing gender awareness and understandings of power dynamics through these social constructs? Um, so uh, beginning with some of the research that Jen reviewed、um, this morning. Uh, features of gender are something that even infants are attentive to. So infants can tell the difference between、uh, male and female faces, and toddlers、um, start to self-segregate in terms of playgroups and playing with people of their own gender. Show some early awareness of stereotypes、um, relevant in the gender context. For example, you know, two and three-year-olds、um, are aware that.、Um, Trucks are associated with boys, and dollars are associated with girls, and so forth. So,、um, all those ideas are there、um, very early in development,、um, and then continuing to the school years and thinking about stereotypes, which I'll let Christia、um, speak to.、Um, I think the question about why、uh, that particular category comes through as a relevant one is a really difficult one because、um, it is hard to do an experiment to understand that question.、Um, what you'd really want to do is Take children and randomly assign them to live in different kinds of environments with some hypotheses about what might lead them to attend to gender, and that experiment is really hard to do given that many children are born into environments that are they're kind of bathed with messages from their culture and a whole society that aligns that way. So I think even before being born, yes, right, right, and so I think that that question is a hard. We can have some hypotheses and we can talk about how、um, different approaches in preschool might. 
reify that category or draw children's attention to it, but I think that question is a hard one. I'll touch on the um, the status or hierarchies part of it too and just say that those are also the kind uh, things that um, uh, really recent studies are revealing that um, very young children are also t uh, attentive to social status and social hierarchies. So, um, for example, in our lab, if we show preschoolers pictures um, where one person is standing like this and another person is standing like this and we ask them, hey, if you had to guess, which of these people do you think is in charge? Um, they're very able to tell you that the person who has more expansive posture, or who has their head tilted up, is more likely to be in charge. So even without anybody telling them, oh, these are the features that you're supposed to be looking for here, here's what you're supposed to respond to, children are also able to look out at the world and kind of do an analysis of people in their positions and what might connote who has higher power and who has lower power. So I'll stop there and I'll let... Yeah, fascinating. Christy, you want to... Um, so I can speak a little bit, too, about why gender seems to be important, um, at least to kids. So not necessarily culturally why gender is important. But we do know that kids, and this is from some experimental work that we've done, is that kids do pay attention to what adults seem to point out as important in the environment. So when things are labeled consistently, so when we say, thanks for coming, ladies and gentlemen, I just labeled your gender as an important characteristic of you. Um, if Think about what it's like for a kid's world world in which they're very color-coded and that which girls are born into pink nurseries and boys into blue nurseries. And then they, we, there's also evidence that um, early childhood classrooms, so particularly preschool classrooms, are some of the most highly gender-coded in terms of the most pink and blue, for example, um, at least particularly in the U.S. Um, and so we do know that that can actually exacerbate over the course of six weeks in, a, in some classroom studies we've done in which we had teachers use gender more, so treat boys and girls equally, but just say, good morning, boys and girls. Let's line up, boy, girl, boy, girl. Let's have the girls get the scissors and the boys get the paper. That type of labeling and coding and using gender in a functional way actually increased gender stereotypes over the course of six weeks. So by the end of the six weeks, girls were more likely to say only boys could be president, for example, um, on the eve of our election here. Um, or on the day after. Um, and so th there's some evidence that girls and boys are really attending to those structural cues and that they seem to be doing it in preschool on. Now, why we pick gender as the thing to label so much is a different issue, but we do know that kids attend to that. Um, and so then in terms of what stereotypes kids are endorsing, by really young, so by, so thinking about this age group, by six, some new research has just come out that shows that both boys and girls assume that boys are brilliant, um, are really, really smart, whereas girls are really working hard and are really, really nice and kind. And so it's this idea that we that kids recognize girls are good students. So by the time they're in kindergarten, girls are typically more compliant students. They follow the teacher's directions. They're doing well in school. But the the question is, well, then why are they not going into things like physics um, and the things that we perceive to be really hard? Um, and so that, that image of Einstein in our heads seems to be really strong and hard to combat. Um, and so by six, kids are saying um, that boys are the ones who are really, really smart and girls are the ones who are really, really kind. And the the reason that matters is the more girls are believing that and endorsing that as a stereotype, the more they're backing away from complex tasks. So if you give them a task that's described as really hard, they're more likely to choose something else when, they, when they've endorsed that belief that um, it's boys who are the ones who are really, really smart, which is the developmentally appropriate language for brilliant or genius. Um, and so the implication then is by six, um, so this is some work by Andre, um, Andre Simpian out of NYU, that by six kids are backing away or shying away from complex tasks girls are when they believe that complex tasks are best solved by boys. Um, and then the damaging part, too, is that teachers also seem to be believing that. And so there's some um, cross-cultural work that's showing teachers across several different countries um, believe that even when girls are doing well in school, it's because they worked really hard, whereas boys are naturally smart. Um, and so it's the idea that even when girls are doing well, they're excellent, that 
teachers and children's explanations, and parents too, um, explanations for why the girls are doing well is because they worked really hard at it, whereas boys are just naturally um, talented at it. And so the implication then is that when teachers are thinking, you know, if someone's struggling, well, girls are working at their maximum capacity because <laughs> they're working as hard as they could do, whereas so they're more inclined than to assume that teacher that boys are able to benefit from the extra work. So the effort becomes to, gir- to boys, just work harder and you'll get it. You're naturally really gifted. You just need to work harder. Whereas girls that struggle are like, you're working as hard as you can. You've really kind of met your threshold. Um, and so I think that becomes a difficult challenge because that can be applied to any domain, whereas girls are perceived as really kind. And then the flip is that boys are, the stereotype for boys is that they are more aggressive and that they, um, and assertive. And the problem with that is that it allows them to often dominate classrooms more. So even when they're young, boys are allowed to dominate the discussion and dominate the conversation. So in the stereotype for girls is that they're passive. Um, And so you see that play out within the classroom context, too. And that's exacerbating some of these later differences that we've been talking about. Thank you. I think some of that research and evidence really brings home a lot of the stakes that we are risking by not attending attending to this critical period in young children's development. And um, if we take that theme of child development and now look at, uh, because I think for both um, Kristen's work and Christia, the research studies that you've mentioned are mostly in the global north, if if I'm correct. Um, So what about how these how these things play out in developing country contexts in the global south. Um, countries in di- different stages of, of economic development, countries at different stages of even having early childhood education. Um, Anna, you've really seen this play out in classrooms around the world um, through your work with VVOB. And just earlier this year, um, you're, you all uh, put out results from a pilot study in Vietnam around uh, preschool classrooms and how some of these processes play out and, and how it, uh, what, what the implications are for young children um, in their learning um, and participation and sort of the underlying hidden messages that they're also learning. Can you tell us a little bit about the intervention and what you found? Uh, yes, indeed. Actually, it started up as a research to find out whether um, you know we could actually um, promote active teaching and learning in a different way without mentioning active teaching and learning, because that's the focus of the government in Vietnam, and uh, trying to see how the teachers could actually implement that uh, in, a, in a non-teacher-led way. Because even though they were talking about active teaching and learning and inclusive uh, education, they were actually having a very teacher-centered approach. So we used a, a Belgian kind of, uh, mm, uh, it's, it's called uh, mm, child-oriented process monitoring, uh, which uh, involves you know, child monitoring, observing the children as they learn and trying to see how their well-being and involvement is, uh, which leads then to deeper learning in the classroom and to you know, absorption of, of all the learning um, that is available to them. So this, this, um, this research was implemented across uh, eight preschool um, preschools and it involved 16 teachers and 216 uh, children and basically the teachers were meant to observe how uh, the children uh, were learning and to also have some screening um, of these of these children over time and uh, one thing that we tried to uh, when we're looking at the selection of the schools we identified schools where um, there was a, a large diversity in terms of ethnic ethnicity so ethnicity became basically uh, our, um, our area of, of investigation, but it also then led to other, uh, to other discoveries. Anyway, just to cut it short, uh, after three observations, so after the five-month period, we found out that um, the boys were actually the ones who were um, not really learning very well. They were at risk of being left behind in their learning, um, while the girls were very, very much, uh, you know, they had a higher level of well-being and involvement. The difference between the ethnic minorities and the, um, the other children who were basically the mainstream um, ethnicity was there at the beginning and it was there at the end. So all children benefited from this, uh, from this methodology, but the ones who benefited most were the children from the ethnic minorities. If we had done this research in a country like uh, you know, Zambia, where we also do early child education, we'd have found a different scenario where the girls were more at risk of, of lagging behind. And this was because the teachers come with their own perceived 
perceptions about these ethnicities and the potential of these other students. So they don't invest much time in trying to identify um, teaching methodologies that can suit uh, the children. And they, 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 go as, um, they don't go an extra mile to identify why the children are not learning. Is it because they're hungry? Is it because they're tired? Is it because they, they don't have you know, uh, um, parents who are maybe attentive to their needs? So they, they, this led to ba- them inquiring further on the children, uh, getting you know, reserving more attention to the ones who were not um, involved um, in in the, in the classroom activities, and so it forced them to actually go an extra mile for the ones who were uh, at risk. So, in a gender, uh, trying to bring it now down back to gender and not to ethnicity, this uh, proved to be a good way. So observing the children and screening them regularly for their uh, involvement in the classroom activities, it's something that can work also in the gender, in, uh, you know, in the gender uh, space because it it uh, it allows for um, each uh, child to have ind- individualized attention from the teacher, and to have you know m- more group work, but you know is maybe diverse, uh, so you don't group the usual and you know maybe. Uh, noisy children, or you don't group the children that are only girls, for example. You try to get the, t- the, the child at the center of your, of your teaching. So very much uh, a child-centered approach. And you mentioned um, the study in Zambia, too. I wonder if you might speak a little bit about the, yes. some of that and some of the differences you found. Yeah. This is still uh, shaping up, so nothing really concrete has come out yet, but we're trying to look at uh, um, uh, teacher motivation, as a way of getting, um, you know, children to be uh, more catered for in terms of their gender as well. Um, but also we're looking at another, which, which is the one that we are, um, we've, has gone a bit further. It's basically looking at, um, you know, gender responsive pedagogy and the impact it has uh, on the child. So looking at, um, you know, how do uh, teachers... Um, also internalize gender because a lot of them are have heard about gender, but uh, they they don't really really realize that they come with a lot of gender uh, luggage. So we're we're trying to now look at uh, what we have seen in the classroom, um, trying to take them through uh, um, self reflection uh, to make them uh, be more aware of, of of what is going on in the classroom and how they are actually perpetrating uh, gender norms. But I'll talk more about that when I look at the and when we talk about the gender toolkit. So. I won't preempt that. Oh, okay. Thank you. Jen, I'm curious, um, because you also, you've started some schools in China. You've started kindergartens. How how have some of the themes that the, your fellow panelists have raised in terms of, um, especially kind of the, the the baggage, the luggage that teachers are bringing into the classroom, how have you seen that play out in China in the Chinese context? Um, I think China overall um, pay attention to the gender equality and achieve uh, in the past year, especially at the parity. Um, but gender issue is somehow invisible in the process and outcome because it's not indicator to measure it. And and mostly those teachers uh, and and educators have not been aware about the the issue. But that is important because when sometimes we, we, we talk with the parents, talk with the teachers, they bring about more, um, not, not the education ideas, but the gender differences. Um, so so that's, that's not only in urban area, but also in rural area. And so all this commonly uh, exists. And in that case, um, we we tend to arouse parents' in interest in in children's potential, and try to bring more um, parental involvement in children's development. Um, right now, in in China, most kindergartens have um, um, parent-teacher interactions and, and and lectures. We involve parents to come. And in, in the schools and kindergartens I, I founded, I, I, I operate with, um, we have a parent, uh, a f- uh, father's club, uh, mainly for fathers. Um, it is the, that club is organized, uh, facilitated by teacher, but sometimes is uh, chaired by the par- uh, dad, dad uh, volunteers. 
So, so that help fathers to pay attention to their children's individual personalities or potentials to to um, spend more time with children, um, to understand more about their uh, the educational ideas, to exchange more about their parenting skills, um, to and to know more about um, the later on the development. Um, for example, the 21st century skills when we were there, fathers are fascinated about that. So many fathers come to take photos about that. So, so it is important to arouse that awareness and build up that uh, uh, educational ideas that will translate into, into interactions and build up the capacity in, in the educational practices. Thank you. So I definitely want to come back to the parents piece, but we're going to come back to that in a second. Because I first want to do a little bit of conceptual clarifying, too, for our audience and also for ourselves. Um, so we have elected to use the term gender-sensitive pedagogy. Um, I know FAWE, the Forum for African Women and Edu- Educationalists, uses gender-responsive pedagogy. Chris, in your work in Sweden, looked at gender-neutral approaches and gender neutral pedagogy. We also have gender aware pedagogy. We have all these different terms. Gen- yes, gender transformative. Yes. So, um, and so as we're thinking about this in the context of early childhood education and the development of stereotypes, it seems to me that there might be a critical period in which gender neutrality is really important for avoiding stereotype development and then the gender sensitive piece coming in later. So I don't know. I would love for you all to think to, to think out loud for us. Um, kind of what what are some of these conceptual issues here, and how do we need to complicate our understanding of gender, gender sensitive or gender not neutral, gender responsive, gender whatever pedagogy in the early childhood years? Kristen, you want to start us off? Well, I'll start off by saying what I mean, what I meant when I um, wrote a paper about gender neutral preschoolers or uh, or what Sweden means by that. And I think it's probably uh, part and parcel of some of the other terms that we'll talk about. But the reason, um, so we did the study where um, we looked at children who were attending preschools um, that had what they described as a gender neutral pedagogical approach. And really what that seemed to mean for them or what really struck us as the dominant characteristic was avoiding the use of gender noun labels and using um, a gender neutral pronoun and language. So hence our term gender neutral because the idea was we're not going to think, oh, um, we're going to see children in terms of being girls or boys and um, respect that they might need different things. It's almost like we're going to um, go over the top of those things and actually not really recognize the categories and just treat children as children and really de-emphasize gender as a distinction at all that we should be paying attention to in our classroom. I'll also say, though, that um, certainly when we surveyed uh, teachers' practices in these classrooms, and we also tested kids, which I can talk about later, when we surveyed the teachers, they also engaged in things like changing songs so that they weren't as um, gender stereotypical. So you might replace uh, kind of a stereotypical male, the stereotypical female name, if you were talking about a construction worker or something like that. So they engaged in some of the other practices that I I think um, might be brought out, but that's why we use gender neutral because we felt that Sweden and its cultural context was using, um, was really committed to gender egalitarianism across the board and in fact legally mandated it, which Jen has you know, um, looked into and described, but that there were some subset of preschools in Sweden that were doing something even more than that, which was to just not talk about or reify gender categories at all. That's not a thing that they were talking about. So hence the term gender neutral, but I'm not sure that that's a very widely used term across multiple fields. It's something that we adopted by talking to the schools and that we used in our papers, but I'll be very curious to hear how other people are using their terms and what might be more common. Others, others, other thoughts. thoughts on that? Yeah, I could go. Um, we didn't give it much thought, yeah. frankly, uh, when we looked at gender-responsive pedagogy. Uh, we're working with FAWE, uh, so they use gender-responsive, and we w- went with that. Uh, but we're working with, uh, you know, uh, other countries, and so the ministries of education are, um, sorry, the ministries of education are also involved. And when we try to talk about gender neutrality in South Africa, they were they were talking about, you know, oh, but uh, you know, 
people should not have a gender. So uh, they felt comfortable with that. But if you go to a country like Zambia or if you go to a country like Malawi, they would want to know, you know, it's either female or male, so it's either he or she, so it's, it can't be gender neutral. It should be uh, responsive. So, yeah, I think it's, it's very contextual and maybe Sweden is more open to such. Uh, but, yeah, in other countries, I think they, they're more um, open to what they're familiar with. And for us, I mean, we didn't think too much about it, so we are fine with gender responsive. But I, but I understand the neutrality piece because, indeed, when we're doing, uh, you know, when you're trying to look at a gender responsive uh, uh, approach, you're definitely trying to eliminate the connotation of either it being, you know, gender, um, female or male. So we, we're trying to implement that. But at the same time, we're just using the terminology responsive rather than a neutral. Oh, thank you. Christia, thoughts on that? Um, I was going to say, I mean, one of the th ways I think I think about it is when I talk to groups of parents or teachers is, I mean, based on the research, what is helpful for kids to reduce their gender stereotypes seems to be actually, I think at the heart of this entire um, language issue too, is really a double-pronged approach. So one is reducing the use of gender um, in your language and in how you're making decisions for kids in a gender-neutral kind of way. So taking gender out of the ubiquitous ways in which we use it to sort and categorize and classify people and all of the ways in which we make decisions for them in their lives. At the, so in some ways use gender less, but then at the same time being more sensitive to the fact that we live in a very stereotypical um, patriarchal society, some of us more so than others, but all of us to quite a bit, to, you know, quite a degree. Um, and to be giving kids language for what that really is so that they're not assuming there are essentialist differences between boys and girls, but that there are structural kind of biases in place. And so helping them understand systemic sexism and bias involves having explicit conversations about gender. So some of the research suggests use gender less in our everyday kinds of language and decisions, but also have more conversations about gender in the ways in which it leads to inequalities in society. Do you think that that seems really, um, I mean, I understand the theory behind it and the conceptualization. Just practically speaking, that seems really hard, right? It seems that you have to recognize the, the categories that society is seeing or how people's lives might be organized, and that involves invoking the categories, which reifies them. But then we're saying, but also don't talk about people in those categories. I mean, how do you, how do you think about the relationship between those two ideas or how that actually gets practically implemented? I think it means be using gender more purposefully, so being uh, purposeful in its use. So take it out of the, there's the you know, don't just say there's the mailman, there's the policeman, there's the businessman. So not using it in those thoughtless kinds of ways, but using it more purposefully. I think that's a really important question of, um, and an important distinction of if you talk about it, then you're making it important to kids. Recognizing, let me take it out of the ways that it doesn't have meaning, because it doesn't have meaning when it comes to there's the businessman over there. It should just be there's the business person, because the gender is not relevant in that context. But then make it a more purposeful part of the decision so that kids can recognize, oh, I noticed that um, in this room about gender, almost everyone here is a woman. Um, and so there I'm actually, because kids are noticing that. So I think it's just being conscious in the use of it. Um, but that's, that involves a lot of, I mean, I'll acknowledge, that involves a lot of cognitive load. That's a lot of thought. Um, and so for a teacher that's also just trying to teach addition, that there's a, that's a lot to ask. Um, but I think it's coming to terms with it in our own minds and then trying to be more purposeful in its use. Yeah. Um, I think, at, at least from the girls' education space, I think there was a time where, you know, I think still in many country contexts too, where education activists and, and um, act, uh, actors are trying to move countries to go away from being gender blind, right? And that is just the outright ignorance, ig ignoring ignorance of gender um, to becoming more purposeful. And if neutrality is used purposefully, then perhaps it still uh, promotes um, an agenda that goes towards gender equality, right? I think, because um, I, I, I would hate for, you know, if there were, you know, political agendas out there that would say, oh, let's take a gender neutral approach and then all of the work that we've done falls to the floor because gender neutrality turns into gender blindness, um, right? 
Uh, Maybe ahead. that's where your point about um, developmental periods or you know moments in children's development when one might one approach might be more appropriate than the other. So I really thought about it you know, so explicitly, but maybe the gender neutrality is really specific to a preschool context. So you're not at a time when children are trying to organize and think about their social world and think about themselves, that you're not getting the habitual labeling of people in terms of that. We should code everything in terms of that. You should behave in accordance with the this category that we've decided you belong to, et cetera. But that when children are ready for discussions about, you know, more systemic biases or, you know, able to have those conversations, the purposeful use of those. Yeah. Definitely. So let's get to um, let's get some some policy opportunity pieces in here. I'd love to talk about that since this is the uh, Girls Education Research and Policy Symposium. And um, Jen, you talked earlier a lot about sort of the policy opportunities that there might be in China today. Um, I'd love for us to think a little bit more about the institutional, the policy, the human resource challenges and opportunities um, that might exist around really trying to infuse gender, a gender perspective in our, into early childhood education. And especially for our audience too, thinking about in places where we, we, we're, we're still trying to get early childhood education on the agenda. So over to you. Um, I think it is really important to touch this issue. Um, but but I, I think it is important to to look at look back what we have been gained um, in China. China make great progress in girls' education. The most important uh, experiences we found is at the institutional level, because because when when China try to promote girls' education, they put an indicator in the accountability system to make sure every girl can achieve and can go to school, have an education. So in that case, it can apply to um, the gender equality. That is to build up those accountability system and to, to have a appropriate, useful in the indicators to make sure the, um, the goal can be implemented um, in, the, in the practice. Um, and also, there are some experiences can be gained from the institutional capacity. Um, for example, in in the lack re, lack of resources context, they need preferential policies. That is what have been gained in the past ten years and twenty years uh, of. Um, universalized education, especially targeted the poor rural minority, um, those uh, girls, mainly for those girls. So so when we do that, we, we still need a preferential policy for under-resourced local areas. And also for intersectoral approach, that is the nature of early childhood. It's different from uh, basic education because it involves health, protection, education. It involves different sectors. It needs to build up the synergy of different uh, departments, especially when talk about teachers. And teachers still a separate department. Uh, in, in the recent years in China, um, um, it, it comes to an intersectoral approach. It involves um, both the government council uh, for girls and women, for government uh, minister from health, minister from education, and within education, there is a synergy to build up the department of teachers, department of education, and department of integrated reform. So, so add them together, it can can make the great progress in implementation. So it is, it's somehow complicated. It's very uh, unique for, for early childhood. And also for the under-resourced rural area, teacher need improvement. How to give the support for that? Um, right now we have uh, technology and then that can be used, and, but it is not enough. It, it would still need a teacher learning community. China, in the past um, many years of poverty reduction, they have built up a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, this kind of mechanism to help the, the from developed er, er, regions to underdeveloped regions to to build up school level, to build up teacher level, to regional level. That that's to help. Um, um, 
the practical needs, the contextual needs, um, in terms of the pra uh, teaching and practices, and also uh, in terms of quantity, this is a big challenge. And right now, um, both the teacher preparation and teacher training needed. Also, to think about diversity when when compare when developing this um, new workforce, thinking about diversity and how to prepare a good staff and for the future. That is also important. There are several uh, considerations in terms of the implementation. Thank you. Let's, so let's, let's, go, let's go to teachers then, because you mentioned teachers. And I know that the institutions and accountability systems and all that need to be, in, across sectors, need to be aligned. And, um, but the critical piece in, the, in our panel, at least that we're talking about, is the teachers. Um, Anna, can you tell us a little bit how teachers have fit in in the context that you've been looking at? Um. Um, yes, teachers, teachers and school leaders. Uh, I think it's very important we always keep in mind that school leaders are uh, equally important and sometimes even more important than teachers because they can destroy or build what teachers are trying to do in the classroom. So um, I think a space that is not utilized enough is initial teacher training. We have all these continuing professional development uh, programs for teachers, um, which are very expensive, and they only capture teachers who are in the classroom. But our administrative workforce is not captured, and those are usually teachers or former teachers, teachers who have you know, risen through the ranks. So I think that's an opportunity that we need to invest in a bit more. Initial teacher training, gender responsive pedagogy should be part of initial teacher training everywhere. And that can bring a change to how you know, chil uh, children are taught, but also how uh, policy is made. How is the space created for buildings? How is the budgeting? How is the planning? How all this is done? Now we have gender focal points in many ministries, but is that enough? That's one person who has to deal with the whole system. It's not enough. And if you look around the world, I mean, we work on initial teacher development as well. There's very few programs that address initial teacher development. Uh, and that's a, a very, very uh, big opportunity to, to bring about change, but it's not utilized um, as it should be. Uh, and also when we're looking at teachers, there's the whole, you know, the minister, for example. What are we offering the ministers in terms of capacity development, in terms of transformative kind of actions? So we need to look at the whole spectrum of education and we need to you know, invest more in, in the whole system, uh, system change. We have a lot of opportunities that you mentioned. There's a lot of political will. We have governments that are signing up to you know, all kinds of uh, commitments and are forming uh, you know, commissions, they're forming committees. But how is that being monitored? Who is checking on these things? Who is, um, you know, who is setting indicators for them? She talked about indicators. That is, that is very, very important. What kind of, how can we check that these targets are, are, are being met? So I think while the opportunities are there, we, we need to ensure sure that there is a trajectory, that there is some kind of implementation plan. But I, I would really like to emphasize the issue of having a whole, uh, a, a more comprehensive and holistic approach towards um, uh, towards the issue rather than focusing on uh, things that are piecemeal, like, you know, the gender focal person or the gender uh, committee or, you know, it should be something that we really live throughout mm -hmm. and in all, at all levels. So if you'll permit me, before we go to audience q and I really want to get into this parent question too. Um, <laughs> So we talked, and we talked, and we talked a little bit about this before you all came in the, in the room too. So, um, as Jin pointed out, um, early childhood is, involves so many different sectors beyond education, right? And the one piece we haven't really touched on too much today is the our parents, and parents are already, um, you know, treating their babies before they're born, when, if, they, if they know the sex of the, of the baby, they're already infusing a gendered life to this child that they're about to bear, right? Um, children are in their homes from zero to the time they get into early childhood care, if they are, if there is that kind of system there. Are we then saying that the teachers bear a particular responsibility then, early childhood teachers, bear a particular responsibility to counteract a lot of what parents might be, um, you know, inculcating into the child, especially in contexts where gender equality is 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 not has not yet really been. I mean, in the U.S., but you know, in places where um, gender norms are very strict, um, 
are we placing too much of a burden on teachers? What, what, is, what is this um, interact? How, how can we better equip teachers to do this? Or are we placing too much on teachers' shoulders? I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on that. Um, I mean, yes, it's too much of a burden on teachers. But yes, I think the burden is also on teachers. <laughs> um, I think that it is a lot to ask. But then I also think what teachers are doing is a remarkable task to ask to begin with, right? You're taking kids, no matter what the context, whether it be differences in socioeconomic status, ethnicity, um, cultural backgrounds, whatever kids are bringing into a classroom, teachers are also having to um, overcome all of those things that the kids are bringing to it. Um, and so I think to begin with, teachers are already having to I don't know, I don't want to say undo what parents are doing, um, but they're having to work from recognizing not every kid is set up for their best potential to be achieved based on what they came to school with. And so in part, teachers have to help kids figure out their best potential, whether that be teaching them math at equal rates regardless of their gender, whether it be helping them read, whatever it is that teachers are having to overcome, um, this is just one of those other things. So I think it's hard to think about undoing what parents have done, but I do think it's recognizing some kids are coming into a classroom um, with different sets of expectations in their early years, so in their zero to four years. So, you know, the study we were talking about in the break room before is, you know, we have some data that shows that parents are talking to their daughters remarkably less about numbers than their sons. So it's almost to a... Um, 10 times more to their sons about early numbers. Like, there's two cars. Oh, there's an apple. You have three slices of um, cheese. It's just that everyday numbers in our language, kids are coming into the very first year of school with less if they're girls and if they're boys. And so teachers have to bring kids up to speed in a lot of ways. And I think also imbue a sense of self-efficacy in girls. So girls we know are going to feel more anxious about math. I mean, there's some cross-cultural work that they come into it feeling less confident. So even though they're performing well across international meta-analyses, we know girls are performing well in math, but they're feeling less confident in it. Mm -hmm. And so in some ways, teachers, their job is in some ways to help kids feel more confident at the things that they're good at. And that's regardless of why they're feeling you know, lack of confidence. And gender just happens to be a really powerful thing that's affecting kids. But yeah. in some ways, the same other, as other characteristics as well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think teachers have an extra burden. Um, but it's also part of the job. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, it's why, you know, not my job. <laughs> Glad that's not my job. <laughs> but what about in contexts where we're still trying to get girls to go to school, right? And so... A, we have a challenge, uh, a challenge about getting early childhood education there in country context, and then two, the second or B, we need girls to go. If if teachers are using, you know, a very, if they're trying to dismantle um, gender norms and gender ideologies, and a three-year-old girl returns to her home and is like, I can. I should be with, I should go to school. I shouldn't be married in a few years, you know, whatnot. Backlash is something that we're very concerned about in the girls' education community. What, how do we handle that? Uh, I think we have to accept that, um, you know, things cannot happen uh, very quickly. And sometimes, you know, we have projects that are a bit too um, ambitious and, we have to look and see that and realize that actually these things take time. And I think it's more impressive on a child to encourage them, as she was saying, on a day-to-day -day basis, encourage them to achieve their fullest potential, regardless of you know, what their family is, uh, is teaching them at home, and also give them some positive role models that they can aspire to be. And that can have um, a better impact on a child to see, you know, to hear about a female pilot to hear about, uh, you know, Malala, for example, if we're talking about a country where, you know, th these things are um, even more complex. Um, so giving them the opportunity of, of having 
uh, role models to aspire to, I think, can be more transformative than just talking about gender and, you know, having um, these discussions openly. Because in some cultures, let's face it, it'll be difficult. And the teacher cannot do does not have and should not have the burden of actually speaking to the parents. They have the space at early childhood education to actually interact more with parents, but sometimes they can't, they can't transform things. So I think we have to accept that in some cultures it's, it's a bit more complex than in others, but uh, we can find strategies, I think, to empower the kids to have you know, all the learning opportunities and, and to have a broader sense of what they can become and that they can do uh, regardless of their, their gender. Thanks. Yeah, Kristen. I, I want to say one other thing, which is that, you know, um, children are really smart, and there are lots of cases where they have to learn that something that's talked about or done a particular way in one context is not done that way in another context. So it's just interesting to think about that school could be a place where people think certain things or tell you certain ideas, or you could think of yourself in a certain way, but that you could have a different self and a different way of being in another context. And that in and itself is an interesting thing for a child to be exposed and to, to grapple with as well. And so... I think that's an interesting thing to think about, so not to minimize the problem of backlash or any of those things, but that children are often in cases where they can do one thing at, at grandma's house and one thing at school and then other things not okay in another place, and they're quite savvy at picking up on, mm -hmm. you know, people thinking that different things are okay and modulating their behavior. Yeah, in our in, a, in the Girls' Ed community, we talk a lot about, you know, reading context and the, the ability to be able to to read what is appropriate in one place versus another. Okay, so I'm way overdue for audience Q&A. Um, we have some folks with mics. Um, if anyone has questions, we'll take a couple of questions at a time and then have our panelists respond in. Hi, uh, Chris McRae. Um, you haven't talked about technology very much, and why I'm introducing it is that I was at a WISE summit last year, and there was a debate between Head Start teachers and people who were programming the artificial intelligence. And five out of six people in this debate were women, four out of six were Chinese, and they were explaining why it was really important to program the artificial intelligent sort of teacher assistant so that the end environment of the classroom was girl positive. So I was just wondering if you come across any of those sort of ideas and indeed more widely how technology is coming into the whole debate. Thank you so much. Kate. Um, hi, Kate Anderson with Unbounded Associates. Um, so um, I'm wondering about, um, especially your re research in the U.S., um, which language groups you've done that on. I'm thinking especially around highly genderized languages like Spanish, for example. Um, you know, when my husband, for example, is a, is a native Spanish speaker, and when he sees the world, everything is masculine or feminine. And I'm finding, as we are raising a young child, that toys have masculine and feminine names, and, and pretty much everything in the world is, is boy or girl related. And so if that has an impact on and, um, on those stereotypes and how they develop and, and can be countered. Excellent, thank you. And then we have Adafunke. And... Uh, my name is Mary. I just wanted to follow uh, what Anderson has asked about toys. I run um, a kindergarten in Kenya, a low-cost private school. And kids carry toys to school, and it's specific toys for boys and toys for girls. And even sharing these toys in class is a fight. And the, the, the boys say, that is not for you. The doll is for the girl. So to follow up on that, I would like to ask if there are complementary models uh, to compromise uh, learning in the home environment and at school for parents, because what we say in school to, uh, to these children, how we train them, conflict with what is uh, being said at home. And then secondly, the teacher trainer and the teachers. The teachers have got their specific backgrounds from the different communities, the female roles and the men roles and they transfer this to the children. So what is it that we are going to do in terms of teacher training so that the teachers know 
what to say because it's difficult. It comes out unconsciously because of one's background. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you for the panel. I just, um, when I was doing the mapping of my, the textbooks, I really struggled with the Arabic language because it's a gendered language. And, um, you know, building on your comment, um, if you want to talk, uh, if you want to speak the classical Arabic, not the spoken Arabic, then you speak in the masculine. So if you're talking about the uh, majority, you're speaking in masculine. And so in the kindergarten, when they switch to the, ma to the classical Arabic, you're actually directly speaking. So you cannot, can we really be gender neutral when you already started gender bias? So how would you would work with such a, uh, I think it's specific per language, how would you? Thank you, Maida. Sorry, and I missed Arafunke. Arafunke, your question. Okay, thank you, Christiana. I want to thank the panelists. I'm actually very excited about the things I've had uh, because I'm in, I've, I've been a classroom teacher and I'm in the training institute now. So one of the questions I want to ask is, is there any relationship of uh, brain theory regarding child's development and this gender bias, because uh, one of the things I've read is that the boy's brain is better than the girl's brain. So how do we nullify that? Because people have that uh, inconclusive research. And with all the examples you've given about boys' brains are meant for math and STEM and things like that. Then the second thing I want to ask is that, is there a way in which the... Uh, policy and the education sector can actually look into teacher training and put in gender sensitive curriculum as part of the things that the teachers must go through. After Brookings in 2013, one of the things I've been doing is talking on gender sensitivity and with my university, looking at how we can put as a curriculum or as a model something that all the teachers in service and uh, 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 pre-service teachers should go through a course on gender sensitivity. You were asking whether teachers have such influence. Of course, teachers have a lot of influence on children, at least for us in Nigeria. They are their role models, they are their gods, they are the people that they see. And because women now work, teachers have a lot of time with the children. And most of the active times of the children, they are actually in school. When they go back home, they're going to sleep. So most of the things they learn in those early years are the things they learn within the school system. So is there a way we can put it into the policy of the Teacher Training Institute that there must be a module or a curriculum on gender sensitivity or gender responsive curriculum? Thank you. Okay. All right, last question by Anna, and then we're going to come back to the panelists. Thank you for sharing your knowledge about how gender is learned during these early years. Um, I'll be honest, I'm, a very, I'm very impatient at this point. I've been working on gender for, I look really young, but it's about 25 years. Um, and I'm from Sweden, it so happens, but I've worked all over the world. Can you share an example of a national system that's actually successfully utilized early childhood education as the time to indoctrinate kids in order to have a successful departure from patriarchy. Is there such a case? So we can stop like continuously talking about, yes, this is what happens, but like who figured it out? Please share that. Sure, thank you. All right, so we've got a lineup of questions. So we've got technology and artificial intelligence. I know that's your forte, Jin. Um, language groups and genderized um, language. How do we get around that if we're really trying to get at, um, I mean, if we're talking in gendered language, how do we, how do we be gender neutral or gender responsive? Toys, complementary models, um, as well as complementary models for home and school. So how do we bridge some of that home and school um, environment um, and teacher training? Brain theory, I think, goes to you maybe. Um, and then this question of how successful models. So I'll um, follow what we did earlier today and allow each of you to choose which question you want to answer. Um, and we'll go from there. Maybe Jen, we'll start with you. Okay. okay. Um, let me start with the technology one. Um, it is a very interesting question. I have been interested in this field for, for years. Um, in early childhood, right now, mainly used in management. 
um, and then uh, I hope later on it will build up resources through technology, technolo technology based resources for teacher to use. But um, as uh, so far, as far as, as I, the literature I reviewed, there is no particular study shows that it has been effective, had been integrated in kindergarten level, especially to, to look at um, gender perspective and to show it there is any um, positive impact in, in children's development. And also I re remember years ago when I look at the OECD report about technology uh, integrated in school. It shows that the, the countries invested in technology most have not get the good results uh, in terms of their children's development outcomes. I mean, uh, academic achievement. So, but technology have been progressing in an um, amazing step. We cannot say in the past it has does not have a great impact in school, but in the future will not. Because, because right now it has to be an issue. We cannot avoid it. And children has to pay, for, pay attention to it. Families and schools, educators, or stakeholders have to think about it. How to better use that uh, technology, also artificial intelligence, so that to make the best part of it instead of, um, how to say, waste or bring the harmless, harmful part. So this is how we look at how we use technology. But I hope later on we'll have more discussion on this and we'll look at it for the future. Thanks. Kristen, which question would you like to tackle? <laughs> or not or the questions. part about which country has solved it for us. <laughs> 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 Let's come back to that. <laughs> um, I wanted to say something about the toy policing with kids because I think that speaks to, you know, this issue of coming from the home and things like that. And I wanted to say that we've been doing some things in my lab to actually try to intervene on kids' stereotypes that they have about other children. And I've been really shocked at how ch open children are when you really sit down and engage them to, you know, okay, so you left this person out, like we pretend we were going to the park and you left all of the boys out and you're a girl, like how do you think they feel? And first of all, sometimes children's initial responses are, oh, well, they don't care. They wouldn't want to be included. Okay, well, now we can tell you how they might feel. Um, and actually showing that when you engage children in that kind of thinking that the next time they have an opportunity to practice who they want to play with or do they want to let somebody play with this toy with them, that they'll actually change their responses and be more open to it. So one possibility, we've kind of been talking about what parents are doing and what teachers are doing, and I guess is to think about taking children seriously in that as well, because children do a lot of policing in that, of that behavior, and if you can engage children as individual thinkers as to what children are allowed to do or how children feel when they're excluded from those situations, I think that could be one point of intervention. And then the second thing I'll say is that I hear a lot of need for research on how parents and teachers could actually interface here. So what are effective I don't I don't think that's something that we don't actually know a lot about and that there could be some really interesting research there about how teachers should be talking to parents about those things in productive ways. In our work in Sweden, um, when we were doing research in gender neutral preschools, it was I thought it would be a problem for us that parents would know that their children were attending gender neutral preschools. They might have sought those preschools out and that would kind of in, uh, make it difficult for us to compare children at that school to another ch uh, school because parents would have really different practices. In fact, uh, only a couple parents in our sample even knew that their child was at a gender neutral preschool, which to me suggests that there's opportunities for educators and parents to be communicating with one another. And it was, it was good for our study design, but it seemed really odd that children were having this experience all day long and parents, even parents who might have been very open to it in that context, were not being engaged here and not being talked to about what was happening at school. So I would think there's opportunities for thinking about how those relationships relationships could be built and what are effective ways in different places to do that. I think it's a really important question. Anna, you. Maybe. Um, I'll go to the teacher training. Great. <laughs> I was going to ask you for that one. 
Yes. Um, so teacher training. Um, as VVOB, uh, we are promoting a um, gender-responsive pedagogy toolkit for early childhood education. There's one already in existence, which has been developed by FAWE. I think it's about 15 years old now, and which is targeting adolescent uh, children. But we're looking at now how do we uh, get gender-responsive pedagogy for early childhood, because then that brings about the change for all, and it's transformative uh, for the teachers already at that age, uh, for that age group. Um, indeed, uh, how are we going to get this now in all teacher training institutions? That depends, of course, on the countries. But like I said before, there's a lot of opportunities in terms of policy because a lot of countries have now through the Af African Union, I'll speak about Af Africa in particular, um, are now signing up to all these uh, international commitments. So it's an issue of monitoring how they do that, but also trying to see how this can be done uh, broadly without you know, looking at issues of culture. Because as soon as you talk about gender, people feel like, oh, it's going to impact on my culture. So it's about, you know, sensitizing uh, policymakers in country to make them understand that this is not going to do any damage to anybody um, and trying to infuse that in initial teacher training. Our goal, and we're going to make a bit of noise about it once we launch this uh, toolkit, is to really have initial teacher training, to have this as a compulsory course um, so that, you know, there's... Few, uh, less investment in the course of the years. You target everybody, uh, and eventually the whole system will have uh, gender, engendered kind of policies, engendered kind of uh, teaching uh, methods. Yeah. Thank you so much. Christia, you want to touch on the okay. language and the brain, perhaps? Yes. <laughs> um, so I think the language is an important question, and researchers are, I think, really starting to deal with that. Um, and so I do know of two studies that have looked at that and both found different things. So in other words, I don't know. But I do think it's an, those are important questions that people are actively doing. Sometimes they find when the, langu when the particular language is more gendered, kids have stronger stereotypes. But that's, Kristen, as Kristen pointed out a little bit ago, that's also really confounded with all the other ways in which cultures differ. Um, and you can't necessarily do that experimentally. Some studies find that there's no difference. So I think it's hard to know the answer to that. So maybe stay tuned, because I think people are still trying to figure that out. The brain question is also an area where people have done a lot of, question, a lot of research. And it's because there is often the idea that boys and girls have different brains, or, you know, uh, very gendered brains, a pink brain and a blue brain. Um, and so I'll say, I'll reference a colleague of mine, Lise Elliott, wrote a great book about called Pink Brain, Blue Brain. So if you're interested in that, I'll reference you to her work. Um, but I'll say there's, part of the problem with that is most of the studies on brains are done with about 12 men and 12 women that they put in an fMRI and they look at what parts of the brain get activated in a particular task and one small part gets activated, just a small amount. Um, and then it'll go on the news and it'll be in the paper and they'll say, men process emotion different than women. Um, so, but Daphne Joel is a neuroscientist in Israel and she, I think, does some of the nicest work on this topic. And she has a theory that she calls a um, gender mosaic. And what she really says is, Yes, I may do a study with 10 men and 10 women. I find this part of the brain is activated in an emotion processing task. But we are not all just this part of our brain. We, are, we have complex brains as humans. And so what she did was she put hundreds of women and hundreds of men um, in these similar types of tests and looks at all of the parts of the brain that have ever been identified as having a sex difference and then she said, looks at, well, if that's the case, then as a woman, as a cisgendered woman, I should have all of the parts of the brain that have ever been identified as more female should look like the female brain in my brain. And those that identify as cisgendered men, all of the parts that are identified as looking like men should all be male typed. But what she finds is that's not at all what the brains look like when you put more than 10 people in a um, fMRI machine, and really what she calls is, when, and so she's got these great slides that I do when I give a talk sometimes, where she finds that this part of my brain might be structurally similar to a female, but this part's like a male, and this part's like a female, and this part's like a male, and this part's like a female, and this part's like a male. And so when you're talking about individuals, there is no such thing as a 
female brain and a male brain because we're all a mosaic of all the different parts of a brain. Um, and so when you take a teeny tiny snapshot, there might be a difference. But the reality is because the individual differences are so much bigger than the group types of differences that it really is a wash when it comes to picking out the brain as a whole. Um, and so neuroscientists can't tell by looking at brains which are male and female. There's lots of people that have spent a lot of time looking for differences, and there aren't very many of them. Um, and so part of it comes to education. I know a trend in the U.S., um, which is what led me into doing more of these conversations about to teachers and parents, a trend in the U.S. is to base a lot of education on these supposed brain differences. Um, we had policy changes in 2001 that allowed for people to be innovative and to um, make a lot of changes based on sex and gender. Um, and so it led to people really relying on these neural, supposed neural differences and having all of these big implications about saying that girls could not learn abstract thought and really had to have hands-on demonstrative props to do it. Um, and it led to a lot of um, ramifications in the classroom. And the data is just not there. I mean, people are looking for it. Um, and when you look at a complete human brain in an actual individual, there don't seem to be differences in any kind of reliable way. Thank you. So we are out of time for questions. I apologize. This has been a really tremendous conversation. We started off really wanting to make sure that we you know, made a case for early childhood educators in the girls' education ecosystem, and I think the case is quite clear. I mean, dealing with gender stereotypes in an early childhood age are, is dealing with fundamental issues in gender inequality that surface much later in life. And if the girls' education actors don't pay attention to this, I think uh, much of our efforts of the adolescent years are, we're not going to see that um, change that Anna, you speak to, spoke to, trying to work in this area for 25 years, not seeing yet. Um, we saw cases from around the world, China, Sweden, uh, Vietnam, Zambia, the US. And while you know we, our panelists spoke to some really great research. I think we, there's still a lot more research that needs to be done in order to, for us to be able to say, you know, a gender-sensitive pr approach in early childhood will lead to certain kinds of outcomes in adolescence. I think we still need that. But the case is quite clear that we really need to be focusing on this, on this period in, in, in childhood and, and in education. So I want to thank you all for your great questions, for your attention. We have a coffee break, and then we will be back uh, in Falk or in the overspill room here at 4 o'clock for our last panel. So thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.